Dear friends, as we continue to reflect on John chapter 9, we've seen a man born blind with a lot of questions. Has his parents sinned? We've seen him cooperating with the grace of God. We've seen him taking a leap of faith and doing that which needs to be done in order for him to heal himself and for God to manifest his glory. We've also seen how he moves into a community that is not transformed. And we've seen the confusion it has created with that community. But there's something else that I also want to talk about. His community did not accept that he's healed. Does the community that worship with him accept it? Not really. He's taken to the Pharisees. And when he's taken to the Pharisees, they look at him and they're like, who is this man? And they say, well, this man was born blind, but now he can see. And the Pharisees are like, how can that be? You were blind from birth, which goes back. They also believed to some of them that the man was cursed. Have you ever been hurt by the church? Some have. And it is possible to happen. While God remains in the church, the church is not God. The church is divine, but also human. The church is holy, but also with a lot of men and women who are sinners, sinful of healing and of destruction. So the man goes into the community. He himself does not go to the community because he wants to prove to them I'm all well, I'm all transformed. But he is taken to the Pharisees. And when they take him to the Pharisees, then a dialogue takes place and there is division amongst the Pharisees and Jews. And the division stems from the reality that Jesus killed the man on the Sabbath. And the bone of contention here is not the man was killed. The bone of contention is that he is killed on the Sabbath. And so the question is, how can a man of God do that which lawfully or legally is unacceptable? So they, they, they stick to the rule and they say, on the Sabbath, you cannot do this. And Jesus says, the rule and the law should never compromise life of a person. And how many of us are perfectionists? We want to do everything by the book. And because we want to do everything by the book, we miss the spirit of the Lord. We miss the reality that the law is there in order to help us to love as best as we can. It is not there to respect, but it should be there in order to liberate us. And so they take this man to the Pharisees and they say, if Jesus is a son of God, if he's from God, he cannot do this. And others are saying, but can a sinful man perform such great miracles? This leads me absolutely into who we are. Have you fallen in love with the God in you? If you go to the people from the Eastern background, the Hindus, when they greet the temples, they fold their arms, their hands, and they say, Namaste. The divine in me acknowledges the divine in you. In the Catholic faith, Peace be with you. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon you and also with your spirit. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. Have I fallen in love with the divine in me? Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life. But he or she who eats my body and drinks my blood lives in me and I in him or her. How many of us believe that you, I, we, are the bodies of the Holy Spirit, are the temples of the Holy Spirit, that God lives in me. 
and look at what God can achieve in and through you. Because they ask an important question. If he is a sinful person, can he do so much good? Look into your own life. How much good have you done? And there's so much good that you've done, that you are doing, that you continue to grow. And what does it say about us as human beings? That God lives in us, yes, that's true. But there's something divine in all of us. And the Pharisees were divided. Then they ask a man. But before they ask a man, they call his parents. They say, well, this is your son. And they say, yes. He was blind from birth. They say, yes. Who healed him? And us. That's what they say. We don't know. He's old enough. Then let him speak for himself. How many of us, how often in our lives, when we are faced with danger, we forget to hold up. We stand on the fence. The parents could not stand for the truth. They couldn't say, well, yes, he is healed by the man called Jesus. And the scriptures becomes very clear. Why were they not able to do that? Because they were scared of the Jews. They were fearful. And how many of us are filled with fear? We can no longer proclaim the truth. Relativism. Pope Benedict spoke a lot, spoke a lot about relativism. And we say, well, if it's good for you, it's good for you. If it's good for you, it's good for you. What happened to the absolute truth? Everything is relative to up to my needs, to the situations. What about the truth? Should we not also continue to stand for the truth and prove that which we know is right? And how often does fear prevent us from living our lives to the best? And so the parents wash their hands and they say, ask him. And so they ask the man, now go back to what I said earlier on. Did the man know Jesus? No. Was the man a believer? Probably not. And so they ask him, well, were you blind? He says, of course. How did you, how were your eyes open? Well, I met a man, his name is Jesus. He put a clay, a, a clay on my eyes and he told me to go and wash. I went and I washed and, and I started singing. He's narrating the twins innocently. And they said, no, but it is impossible. And he says, well, that's what I know. Then they ask him, what do you have to say about this man? Some of us think he is a sinner. Some of us think he's not from God. What do you think? What does he say? Oh, well, I think the man is a prophet. I love what Mother Teresa once said. She, as a Catholic, she said, if I meet a Hindu, and there's something good in that Hindu, I take it. If there's something good in a Muslim, I'll take it. If there's something good in a normal, ordinary person, I'll take it. And she says, my vision in life, my purpose in life, is not to convert the whole world. But if there's anything good that you see and love in my Christian Catholic faith, please take it. And I think that's something that's really powerful. A man who was probably not a believer, knows nothing about God. In Christ, he's so because that's a man that healed him. What do they do in the church? They kick him out. They cast him out. Why? For telling the truth. Does it still happen to them? How many of our Catholics are able to stand and to speak the truth publicly with charity? How many of us compromise the truth just because we want to be loved and accepted? We know this is wrong, but we can't talk about it because Father is going to be upset. We can't talk about it because the bishop or the cardinal is going to be upset. We can't talk about it because everybody else is going to be upset. When do we stand for the truth? When do we become honest with ourselves? And so, as someone else said, the evil continues to exist in the world. Why? Not because the evil is good, because good people stop to do the good they ought to do. Let's go back to the other argument. 
I was talking about, about coronavirus. It's not from God, it's not from the devil. We know that somehow it started with human beings, by human beings, whatever happened. How will it continue to stop? Or how will it continue to spread? Through other human beings. Go back to what Father Stephen kept on saying. He came to a greater realization that his actions could impact 7.7 billion people in the world. What I do today will impact the world tomorrow. And so one of the things that needs to stop is when I do that which needs to be done, when I become a responsible citizen, when I do the right thing. If you go to the news, many people have heard pastors and have seen pastors say, people must guard their numbers. Nothing will happen. The president is not God. That's not true. That is called irresponsible. If we are responsible in doing that which we can do, we can stop the spread of it. And so too with this man, he stands for the truth, so that the truth may prevail. But not everybody is willing to take the truth, they cast them out. Jesus hears about it, and he goes and he finds them, and he asks him a fundamental question. Do you believe in the Son? The other way of asking that question, what do you believe in? Do I have any faith? What do I believe in as temple? Do I believe in anything? Do I believe in God? In the midst of everything, confusion, do I still believe in God? And that's a personal question that everyone has to answer one day. I still believe. And the man says, but who is he? How can I believe in the one that I don't know? And Jesus says, I am he. He has met God face to face and initially he did not know. But look at what he does. He had met God face to face. He didn't know it. He was in a moment of grace. He didn't know it. It is only the second appointment with Jesus that he come to realize that he's in the midst of God. He's in the presence of something greater. Look at the person next to you. Do you know how great that person is? And there's something great that lies in each and every one of us. Even though I'm not able to myself. And for many people, they struggle with self esteem. They've done for themselves. They struggle in, de in discovering and realizing who they are. And we need to remind ourselves, and I believe in this more than anything. Jesus looks at us every day. And he says, You're my one well, you know, you well, you well, beings, you're my beloved well, son, my beloved well, Lord. He looks into our eyes and he says, Wow, you, you're one of my best creations. You are the masterpiece. And why do I say this? Because Jesus goes and he finds the man. He finds a man who's been kicked out from the synagogue. He goes and he looks for him. And when he meets him, he says to him, the world may have rejected you, the church may have rejected you, but I haven't. People may not believe in you, but I still believe in you. And the man says, I believe. What does he do? The last thing that he does, he looks after Jesus, he worships him, and he has a relationship with Jesus. God bless the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.